It's always, uh, May always organizes impressive events, and May is so organized, and I'm so disorganized, so she always says, what are you going to talk about? And I think, oh my God, am I going to prepare something? So what I thought is at least let me look up what's an entrepreneur in the dictionary. So it's said that an entrepreneur is somebody who is associated with running an enterprise, usually a business with considerable initiative and risk. The operative words were highlighted were any, um, risk, and initiative. I think I probably um, can say yes to the last two, so maybe I'm an accidental entrepreneur. So what I thought is I'll tell you a little bit about my life, I may as alluded to it, and my main job, um, and, and really I want to talk to you about the lessons I've learned uh, in my career in um, social entrepreneurship. So in my medical practice, I'm a skin cancer surgeon. Um, I probably have the busiest practice in the country. I only say that not boastfully because um, from a statistical point of view, when I used to operate in the public hospitals in Auckland, each DHP gets roughly 2,000 referrals from GPs a year to do with skin, skin cancer, anything to do with dermatology or surgery associated with that. So that means the entire public system in Auckland gets 6,000 referrals from GPs in my specialty. My free work alone for the last 15 years is 7,000 a year, right? which means we are bigger than the entire public system in Auckland. And I refuse to claim any subsidies because I think that would be cheating. So what it means is that I've saved the system $30 million. I and mean, I think it's astounding. That's crazy because what's crazy is not the money I saved, but what's crazy is that I could have actually earned so much for just cutting bits of skin. I think that's just wrong. Right. Anyway, um, I've been doing this for a long time. I've been a doctor for 26 years, right? My next birthday, I'll be 49, right? Um, the other thing I've done is um, written a book, Skin a Biography. That's actually out. That talk, do, does talk about skin color and the politics associated with it. Um, but there is another book which just come out this month, or it's going to be released next week, called Democracy by Brown Skin for Brown Skin. Right. Um, so I've written um, four novels, three books of nonfiction. This month I had a volume of poetry and a kid's book come out in America. Now, now the funny thing is, right, um, it may be some sort of record if it was my full-time job, but I'll tell you um, how you can do it. See, um, the... From an entrepreneurship or a pure business, um, my skincare company, which we're currently in talks with L Capital, which as you would know is the investment arm of Louis Vuitton Group, uh, to do with a mechanics range there as well as a new sunscreen we developed. Now how that came about was as a child, um, I was born in England, and my parents went to India. Uh, there were people in the fields who used to rub oranges on their skin and I was thinking, why are they rubbing the outside of oranges, why are they not cutting it up? So that stuck in my head, like May says, things get stuck in my head, and then I kept researching biotechnologically from the outside of orange, peel, orange peels, and that form, formed the foundation of our extracts. But the point where May has seen dealing with melanomas and skin cancers, you're also speaking to people at the terminal end of life, quite sadly. I had a kid today who just came to see me, um, and he was very worried because I'd seen his mother about a year ago. Um, his mother was 42, and um, she lasted 42 days after a melanoma, right? So what it means is, what I've found is, when you talk to people at that end of life, um, I always say to you, you know, what you must do is every now and then you must give your life uh, the obituary test, as I call it. Think about writing, a, like a writer, you always like to summarize everything in one sentence. Write one sentence about your life, back page of the New Zealand Herald. Right, when I've spoken to people at the end of life, people have spoken about people they love, things they wanted to do, places they want to travel. But nobody said to me ever, I wish I had a better CV, I wish I'd worked harder, I wish I'd become the head of investment banking at Merrill Lynch. <laughs> Sorry, I hope there's nobody from Merrill Lynch here. Really. Right, but, but what I mean is that, you know, so basically in any of my businesses, the good thing about the obituary test is if you make um, match your ideals with your businesses, then it's easy to pass it. So for many years, I had a bookstore cafe. We actually had them in Australia, New Zealand, called Bachi Lounge. Uh, people who have seen the Rialto movies, they might remember it across. Uh, in fact, bizarrely, uh, because we didn't have any prior experience, we actually won Auckland's top shop for retail in 2008, beating every other cafe in Auckland. Um, so the point I'm making with the second point is this is, how do you find all this time? And I think how do you find the time is, there's 
plenty of time um, if you also remember um, to give other people time. Um, this was the second book I was talking about. Okay, so one day a week, um, when I'm in the country, I don't work even in medicine or at the university where I teach, but I um, teach creative writing for children in Lord Desal schools. Scarily, there are 99 Lord Desal schools in Auckland, right, which is 100 schools just in Auckland region alone. That's frightening. So what I talk to the kids about is, you see, the three tropes of writing stories is um, the context. You know, you need to get the context right, and you develop your character, and you resolve conflicts. That's not just for writing stories, but that may be a parable for life itself. So we work with these blocks. But one of the things about blocks is I mentor writers. I always give people time. So if somebody rings me up and say, I'm writing this book, I say, OK, let me have a look. I'll give you some advice. The problem with writers is everybody's complaining about the writer's block. I have a word for it. It's called laziness. Right. If you really think about it, does may I get lawyer's block? Do I get surgeon's block? Why should writer's block be unique to a lawyer or to a writer? Anyway, so the point is, so that's the second lesson is this. And when I was thinking about the point, it just came to me that creativity makes people more powerful and also uh, makes them more productive. That's the reason why people in Hollywood are successful, right? And, or people in Bollywood. Are, um, so, so that's why the creative industries make people powerful. But creativity is like a torch. It, you know, it can shine a light on a lot of things, but you need motivation, which is like the batteries for the torch. So while I was thinking this, while I was sitting here, it just struck me that the Sanskrit word, um, entrepreneur, means self-motivated. To me, it sounds very much like entrepreneur, does it not? OK, so this slide I put up because, of course, it was a day when there were no digital cameras. The only picture I got of this bull. So what happened is when my folks went to India, see, my parents screwed me up because they made me a social entrepreneur because whatever they did, they did a lot pro bono. So they went back to India from England, left medical careers, and did medical mission work. So we were in places where there was no decent civilization, even for India, and uh, setting up hospitals. So I went to primary school in a bullocat. So that was the bull which took me. I don't have a picture of the cart, unfortunately. It didn't get saved. But anyway, so the funny story was this. The bull was colorblind. I think it was, maybe, anyway, because it used to hate this Audi. India being a land of extremes, in 1972, we had an Audi, right? And this bull would cut off the Audi at the intersection. So I got to school first. But, but you see, if you think about it, the Audi was green. The bull was colorblind. Let's look at the statistics here. The bull was 900 kilograms. I looked up an Audi 72 was 1,100. Um, the length you can see there, the bull had one bull horsepower, and the Audi had 109 brake horsepower. But you see, three years ago, Harper Collins asked me to write a story of my, my, about my life. I wrote it, and it was actually called The Bull Who Dreamt He Was a Lamborghini, because you know, Lamborghini's emblem is a bull. But at the end of it, I pulled the plug on the story, because I thought to myself, there's lots more I want to do in life, and there is a time to write your story, and it wasn't the time. So I sent the check back. They said to me, I was perhaps the only author they ever had who sent a check back given as an advance against royalties. But I think, you know, that's, it's good to be unique. OK, the important thing when I teach at universities is I have a fundamental problem with our education systems. Because we impart knowledge, but we don't teach people how to think. Speaking of think, I was at Think last year, which was one of the largest thinking conferences in the world. There were five Nobel laureates. Uh, there was somebody from science, technology, Zach Hook and Guru of 3D printing. Only reason it got any media is they put my talk between interviews with Robert De Niro and Bianca Jagger. So that's me with my friend Bob. Not that I'm name dropping or anything. But, but anyway, about a couple of months ago, I was a guest at Oxford University. And they've asked me to come back next year and speak about authentic leadership. The funny thing which struck me at Oxford being the guest is they were so kind to me. They said, you're a writer. You must stay in C.S. Lewis's old room. So that's C.S. Lewis's old room called the Lewis Room at Keeble College, right? where he was when he was in the military. But the funny thing about Oxford was that they just couldn't get enough of my life. So forget about speaking about skin, about my science, my research. But they kept wanting to know about how I could bridge east and west and fit everything else that I did. But I'm going to talk to you about two things. This is a uh, thing that I'm a scientist as well. I want to tell you a couple of things about it. See, one of the reasons in life where people um, don't um, get all the things done is because you get bogged down by the small stuff. And let's look at it at a fundamental level. I say at a molecular level, um, the NR of two pathway, which I illustrated there, basically is your stress response. So let's say 
The same pathway, interestingly, deals with if you're aging, if you get into sun and get sunburnt, which is photo-aging, or if you're under emotional stress. So in other words, if you're seriously emotionally stressed, you're going to age. Go in the sun too much, you're going to age. You see you don't live life properly, you're going to age. So the fundamental thing is this, is that it's how you handle that stress matters. I'm very disruptive in all the fields I work. Just think about it. I mean, if you're bigger than that entire public system, everybody hates you because you, that means you control a massive proportion of the business market. But the reality is, is that shouldn't get to you. You know, when you're driving, somebody cuts in, does that get you angry? You know, all those things are secreting the stress response. But here's this interesting thing I found when I was researching this. We tried out some vitamin C serums. We put them on our skin. We have a scanner. We can check that after a while reduces your wrinkles, your aging. So what we said is, all right, let's um, try vitamin C pills. Didn't make a difference, so I thought there's something wrong with my scanner. But now we know a thing called xenobiotic metabolism, which is that if a thing comes in a foreign form, which is not meant to be in its natural form, so in other words, you eat an orange, you get some benefit. Um, we know that it doesn't work. So in other words, supplements can make you worse if you're ill. Right? We know that from cancer research. But you know, it's not human psyche. Human psyche is, oh my dear, you're looking a bit run down, you better take this vitamin. That'll make you even worse. So the time to take supplements or vitamins when you're feeling well, not you're feeling ill. Okay, that's my medical bit. But the diversity factor, because, um, see one of the problems in um, New Zealand is sometimes anybody who doesn't look European always remains an outsider. Like I've been here for 24 years, I won the New Zealand Medical Association's highest award. It's only been awarded to one doctor across all specialties at a time, and only about five times in the last 20 years. And somehow I was in the firing line. I was in the finals of the New Zealand of the year, but what I mean is still the odd time I might get a patient who would ring my rooms and ask, what nationality is he? Does it matter? But what struck me when I was in Oxford and I spoke to the alumni at Stanford uh, earlier in the year was that this. There's a lot of research. See, we know the benefit of universities, they create human capital. We know the benefit of industries, they create physical capital. The social capital of networks like this are vitally important. Why? Especially networks like this because of what I call the capital of diversity. There's plenty of research which shows that when you create a more diverse pool of thinkers contributing ideas, you create knowledge. So one of the things we're talking at Stanford is, for example, you go to Google, you go to Facebook, what do you see? You see a lot of Asians, not just because the parents put an emphasis on education because it's a diverse viewpoint. So the more diverse you are as a society, the more knowledge you create. And why is this creating knowledge important? The reality is, in New Zealand, we're at the bottom of the ocean, at the bottom of the world. No, we're not on the way to anywhere else. So our economies really need to be knowledge-based economies, especially in the age of the internet. Like Derek said, everything can travel very easily. So basically, um, you know, this is the age uh, when we should be creating businesses which are knowledge-based. And if we want to create businesses which are knowledge-based and increase the knowledge, then we need a lot more diverse viewpoints. Now, sometimes, you see, with all this, you also need to, I love, uh, because see, the problem is we are geographically isolated. So before I finish, and speaking of isolation, a few years ago, I said, okay, I'm going to club, trick in the Himalayas, clear my head, and write another novel. So that's my second novel. It's called To Kill a Snow Dragonfly. By the way, I expect all of you to go to my website and buy all my books today, because all the profits go to programs for these children. Right? Um, so anyway, uh, so what I like to say is when I was traveling these mountains, people heard, hadn't heard of New Zealand, they hadn't even heard of New Delhi, which was probably the closest country. Anyway, so I saw, I've met some Sherpas, I'm having some chat mostly in sign language, and it's amazing how you can communicate with people if you spend some time with them. So I've learned these lessons from what I call the Sherpa School of Business. So the first one is this, your, your ability in business or in life to climb a mountain is not proportional to the number of times you fall. So don't be afraid to fail, we all have. The second thing is this, your ability to climb a mountain is not proportional to somebody else's ability to climb the same mountain. So don't try and trip them up. Sometimes in New Zealand, we tend to think like that. So the moral is uh, don't be afraid to take risks. See, in this room, we have a diverse crowd. But all of us can therefore be boiled down into three types. You're either Judeo, 
Christian Islamic, which means those of you who believe in heaven or hell. You're Eastern, Hindu, Buddhist, Shinto, you all think you get reincarnated. You're greeny atheist. You all get just recycled by earthworms. But what's, but what's common in all this is, in this form, as myself, Sharad, or Marissa, Derek, May, this is our only chance to make a difference. So let's not screw it up. Thank you.